Okay, um, uh, welcome back. Uh, as promised, our next lecture is by Ksenia Tatarchenko, who received her PhD uh, from Princeton University, actually, so I know her from, uh, from those days. Um, in, uh, we graduated in 2013, you got it, right? All right? In 2013, from the history department, um, working on a dissertation at that point on Akadem Garadok, which we all very much look forward to um, uh, seeing uh, emerge in book form in the near future. Uh, Ksenia was actually also uh, one of the contributors to the Russian computer scientists at home and abroad project, so she is a figure known to the European University and has uh, known uh, a bit uh, what we've been up to in the past few years. Um, she is currently in Lausanne, but now you're going to have to tell us more about what the Arctic connection is about, uh, because I, this is where my expertise in your biography um, begins to be spotty, so maybe you can say a few words about that and then uh, we'll let you speak. Okay, wonderful. So should I do it in English or in Russian? Я могу по-русски, но я как бы я я я и так плохо и так плохо, поэтому мне все равно. Как вам удобнее? Нет, потому что как бы ну получается я же не владею как как некоторые. Вот, но но то есть по-русски я тоже не совсем привыкла, поэтому. Давай как вот. Ну давайте я по-русски. Да, давайте я про себя расскажу по-русски, а потом как бы более такую официальную часть сделаем на английском, потому что как бы существует текст, хорошо? Поэтому собственно говоря, то есть я очень благодарна Диане, потому что наверное. Нужно еще раз подчеркнуть, что это очень такая замечательная возможность для нас втроем здесь оказаться всем вместе, потому что у нас, собственно, очень многие идеи есть общие, когда они еще и физически сближаются, то есть они просто у нас, я думаю, будет такой взрыв идейный. Вот. И если говорить еще раз о том, чем занимаюсь я на сегодняшний день, то есть вот ту работу, которую я представляю сейчас, то есть опять-таки еще раз мне очень приятно, потому что это... Эта работа существует в виде текста, который будет, я надеюсь, опубликован. Поэтому, если вы еще хотите что-то добавить и как-то это извинить, это еще возможно. Вот, то есть в плане того, что это workshop, то есть это настоящий workshop, то что еще, еще можно что-то куда-то это пододвинуть, да? И, собственно говоря, то есть на сегодняшний момент у меня три больших проекта, то есть один связан именно с, с пониманием, изучением социалистического информационного общества в контексте холодной войны. Потом я занимаюсь политикой и экспертизой на примере Академгородка из сибирской науки в позднесоветское время. И новый совершенно проект — это полярное исследование. Вот. И у меня, собственно говоря, то есть некоторые те педагогические вопросы, которыми я занимаюсь на примере Академгородка, я бы хотела их перенести в контекст полярных исследований, и в частности, как бы милитаризация Антарктики и антарктической науки, и в то же время параллельное создание международной науки в контексте Антарктиды. Вот так, то есть это вот такие у меня пока идеи. То есть, собственно говоря, то есть я очень сильно интересуюсь всеми вопросами, связанными как бы с местом социалистических форм знания в, во времена Холодной войны на разных примерах, да, то есть от виртуальных до, до полярных. Uh, okay, so I think I'll try to switch to English. If anything sort of goes wrong, I'll just go back to Russian or French, you know, with like, you know, <laughs> yeah. well, just in case, so I hope should be sure that I understand myself. <laughs> no, nisipa. Uh, so this one more time, I'll try to explain the title of this talk. Uh, thinking algorithmically comes from the term which was used during the period of time I'll be talking about. So we're talking about the Cold War period, we talk about late socialism. Uh, this was used by American and the Soviet actors, but in the form of algorithmic thinking. So what I want to do with this term today is to take it more as a historical tracer, to talk about the Cold War computer science and its formation, as well as about the description that we can give of a socialist information society and information culture, and this in itself, as we have been sort of talking since yesterday, is already not actually a trivial task. 
the fact that, that such a thing exists is still a controversy in uh, academic circles, ironically, in a sense. And I think what we share, sort of what is common in our free projects here, is that all of us engage with this idea how we can think about information age, which is not only connected to the liberal economy and the capitalist imagination and values, of course. Okay, so let's go forward if I manage to... Oh, la 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 la, so, okay, so I'll have to scroll, okay. So let's try. So initially this talk was conceived for an audience of not historians, but of, uh, for a community of which is information right now, and they call themselves um, algorithmic studies, you know, so, you know, sometimes it's enough to add <laughs> the word studies to another term and this is how so, new fields come into being, at least in the American context. So that's why I wanted to start with the idea that actually the histories of computing are already there, but they have a particular flavor to them. And then I go into my two particular cases which would be uh, about the formation of a discipline and the particular discourses among the computer scientists and uh, the second case on the usage of the term of algorithmic thinking within the Soviet context, of the so especially the context of the Soviet uh, education reforms and I show the connection between these two things. Uh, another disclaimer here is that some people when they hear thinking algorithmically they kind of associate this notion with the rise of cognitive sciences. This is something that I explicitly do not do even if I'm very interested in the topic itself so maybe Ben has like more ideas about that we, 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 we will be happy to talk about that too. Okay so let me scroll. So just quickly so what is this, um, what are the existing uh, historical narrative? One interesting example here comes from a relatively recent book, Networking Peripheries, so, uh, where we have the discourse by Rodrigo Arbaleda, uh, the leader of uh, one laptop per child initiative, and as you can see, I'm not going to read it for you, but it's this kind of binary, right, not only in terms of ones and zeros, but it's a binary from sort of there, they have nothing and here in the West we have it. So the direction of the diffusion of the technology, the expertise and the values which goes with that, it's really unidirectional and is uh, mapped on a chronology. <coughs> so basically, so my arguments are very uh, obvious, so I'm back. I do not want these political assumptions to stay assumptions. I, I really want to sort of to expose them and to see that sort of the, the reality of these things is much more complex as sort of you know have, shown, have been shown in the works of uh, anthropologists in an interesting way. So historians, in a sense, are lagging behind the work which is done in the anthropology and ethnography and information societies. Uh, but there are many other examples. This was something done for, uh, so the, the, I presented this talk to people who are interested in artificial intelligence and logic, and so they kind of are more familiar with these examples. And again, one more time, it's this is a geneal a genealogical narrative which is explicit in well, most of the scientific papers, right, in artificial intelligence. It depolitizes the Cold War origins of these things. Well, as Ben knows so well as well, as he has shown in his book, right, uh, like, Gary Kasparov appears as like this champion, but nobody talks about his politics or the, the, the place he originates from, or even in terms of the technology, kind of the Cold War story of the uh, chess, uh, <coughs> uh, computer chess uh, competition is forgotten. Uh, and even in terms of technologies, there are interesting lessons about sort of the, the meaning of the population. And for instance, uh, the, the article is from uh, Kamsamolka, and uh, uh, I think if you look through the technological achievements of the Soviet computer chess problems, very much like AlphaGo, it was based on the experience of real-life games with readers of Komsomolko, for instance. So this is how they reaffined their algorithms. Um, in, in another kind of methodological introduction here is the role of representations in the work I do here. In particular, 
So one more time, coming back to these many political assumptions built in, into the existing popular narratives about computer history. So the representations, I think, are an interesting place where they actually become visible, right? When the power relations and politics are uh, uh, represented, and I'm not going to spend time to comment on this very famous image, but I really like it uh, precisely because it embodies several types of relationships between humans and machines, and we can see analogy, interaction, hybridization, and mediation all going on here. Um, and I think what we can bring in there in terms of a discussion about the algorithms is precisely this notion of mutability, which was something that the, the this course and algorithmic studies are very much interested in this way to get at the politics, you know, and this is where I think so history is relevant. Uh, again, okay, so historiography. I guess uh, one important point uh, to make is just sort of how few of it exists. Right, I repeat it all the time, so it's for me, it's, I'm kind of bored of making this argument, but if you look into the history of computing today, it's a flourishing field. A lot of publications are coming out, very many new ideas are coming out. The um, uh, Paul Edwards arguments about the interrelation between political discourses and the technological systems, and in particular the computer technological systems employed in the military, which has been uh, talking about since the 90s right now are revised. There are many more complications to that story. So there are, this is like really interesting things are going on. But unfortunately, right, we are in the situation of one hand clapping. So if we talk about the computer as a Cold War instrument, this is something that everybody mentions but never unpacks. We always, in historiography, we meet the American Cold War military industrial complex. Right now, today, we have two book length works on the history of Soviet computing point. Right? I, I think that we do not even need to comment anymore. And here I think I should say that I'm in a very much privileged situation in terms of the access to archives. I'm very fortunate to work on a case which has an electronic archive. And we are talking about the volume of some over 40,000 documents online. So if any of you are in some way interested in Soviet computer history, so it's a personal archive of academic Andrei Yershov, but may, like almost all major actors of the Soviet period have their documents of some kind of interaction. And so we, it could be traced in this particular source. So it's, uh, it's again sort of coming back to this kind of the data question, you know, in, in a uh, different way. Um, okay, and the algorithmization, and actually I know the story behind the archive as well, which has its own, so it's like it's about this digital humanity story that we always talk about, the potentiality, but we like, do not always think about the materiality of these objects and how they emerge and what are sort of the politics of memory behind them. Okay, uh, let's move forward. So let's go back to this emergence of computer science, right? Or what we would call informatica uh, in Russian. So we have different names, but more or less it's still the same discipline with the same intellectual core. In an interesting kind of twist, it is not very well studied even for the American case, but among the pioneers of the history of computing, Michael Mahoney actually have done an uh, overview of intellectual roots of this discipline, which is like a heavily mathematical, if you think probably a movie about Turing. So this is not very much exact history, but the idea that it's, these are mathematical machines are, are very important. And what I wanted to emphasize here, right, so that we have an interesting combination of engineering and material aspects with very abstract scientific questions. And uh, I'm putting this particular quote by Michael Mahoney here to stress that this is a process of construction of epistemic core of this new discipline and that it happens not like the natural, but that the nature itself of computers is something invented. And I think this is something very helpful and uh, we're not going into this direction because we you know we're not at the computer uh, scientist uh, kind of conference room. But uh, just to mention another thing in terms of the state of understanding of what happens to this new discipline formed during the Cold War is that uh, there are kind of new recent publications, in, and uh, in particular, they work by Janet Abater, who traces the institutional 
the, the interaction between kind of the intellectual and institutional uh, combinations of, of um, making of computer science and making of its scientific identity. In particular, there are very curious stories about how you get money, even if you uh, in the, we are talking about the American context of money are flowing. We are talking about this industrial uh, complex um, where these big machines are being built um, uh, at the industrial scale. So the question is like the computer centers are very much have a, a service role, and then to give them an intellectual authority that was the whole process described in these works and which we still want to understand. And actually I have arguments about the international connections as being one of the uh, channels of constructing legitimacy for the new discipline. Uh, in particular, oh la 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 la, let me see. So let's zoom in into one uh, particular event one more time, right? If you were a computer scientist and I would say, oh, Donald Knuth, right? You'd say, oh, of course, Donald Knuth, because actually up to today, many of the undergraduates read his like, really famous book, The Art of Computer Programming, and three volumes, and there are more volumes now. Um, it's really a classical foundational text for the discipline. And uh, he is, uh, was awarded the main uh, award of this community which is uh, ACM uh, Turing Award. And this is uh, was uh, this ceremony took place in 1974 in San Diego. Uh, there are many kind of things that could be said about sort of this particular meeting and the way sort of the community itself uh, uh, decided to award Knuth for his work at this moment. But what is interesting is that Knuth actually had very particular ideas what the computer science as a discipline should be about, one more time about that there is no nature to this discipline that it should be invented, and actually Knuff wanted to call it algorithmics. Right? And, and he was very um, like ironic about the way the, kind of the discipline itself came into being, as you can see during this quote. And uh, in his talk during the, uh, you know, during the ceremony, he uh, called computer programming as an art. He made very interesting references, notably to the idea of two cultures. But one of the things where sort of interesting things come in is that he, a lot of discussion of aesthetics of computer programming, what it really means to do this kind of work, come from the work of a Soviet uh, computer programmer and computer scientist, uh, Andrei Yershov, and from the talk that he gave in the United States in 72. Here, one more time, I don't want to spend the long time because if I start talking about Yershov, who is again like the main character of my <laughs> work, I, I won't stop. But I think what I really want to say here, because we've been talking about cybernetic previously, uh, I think uh, an important factor in understanding his interest in computer science and his professional identity is precisely the separation from cybernetics. He wants to frame Soviet theoretical programming and, and computer science as a separate disciplines, and he thinks a lot in these terms, even if he is a pupil of Lipunov, who is considered one of his founding fathers of the disciplines, so we're kind of in, in interesting internal uh, conversation going on here. But in particular, he's one of the what is called Vyznoy, so he's uh, able to go abroad and he goes abroad frequently. Uh, and this is just one of his many trips to the United States. Um, but it happens that during this particular 72 trips, he gives this talk at one of the largest American meetings. This is a keynote, it's very prestigious. And he talks about not a particular technical details of many projects that he supervises for which he was of, like no, he gained notoriety in the community, but he talks about aesthetics, right? Of the um, about the human factor programming. So basically, he's talking about the social factor. And again, I think what I wanted to underline here is this notion of uh, thinking. But the way he articulates thinking is double, right? On one hand, he draws on a very explicit uh, biblical language. But on the other hand, it's also a revolutionary way of thinking and a linchpin of the uh, uh, second industrial revolution. So we have an interesting rhetorical uh, combination of different levels of discourse. And all of them are mobilized for the same goal of making the profession respectable and so socially uh, uh, respectable. But also, he's talking about basically two aspects. So it's not only that the society should recognize the programmers, but programmers themselves should understand that they are responsible toward the society for, for the work they do. 
And these ideas are very important for Knuth when he talks. So it's like really we're talking about the intellectual community, which is not only conducted through the technical work that they do, that goes without saying, I don't want to go into the details right here about sort of all kinds of programming languages um, and the theories that they exchange, but it's also they're connected in terms of the ideas and values they share. So this is where I'm talking about the people who think together, right? Um, so before I switch to the next slide, uh, I also want to underline the fact that it's not only discourse, they, these people really meet, right? And not only meet, they keep on meeting, right? They put a lot of energy in meetings. Uh, and one of the most interesting meetings that was organized during the 70s, and I can, uh, if you are interested later on, uh, uh, and I, uh, I can explain kind of the political framework which enables this particular meeting. But this takes place in Uzbekistan, <laughs> in Grinch. Um And uh, if, uh, I've, I don't know how much of you are familiar with the history of Uzbekistan, but you can imagine that, uh, well, just it's enough probably to say that this is a cotton producing republic, right? It's not particularly known for its high tech. And to have somebody like Knuth, who is like one of the most famous computer scientists all the time, and he was not the only person coming there, so there's a big group of people there, about 50 scientists all together, gathering in Uzbekistan in Ugrich, was a pretty big event, and so there is a lot of media coverage of this uh, uh, event, and Knuth clearly plays with that. So, for instance, he would say to journalists that your region should become the mecca for all information technology specialists. Right, and of course this appears in Kharyazmska Pravda, and uh, we, we understand pretty well how this works for the self-promotion of the region and regional authorities who sponsor the conference. Uh, and it, but, but Knuth is not only joking, he's not only making it up, so he actually has real ideas, so that this is connected to his design of, of what computer science should be about algorithms. All right, uh, this is why they want to go there, because if you see that most of uh, us who grew up, uh, you know, in, well, not most of us, some of us who grew up in the Soviet system, right, all of us know that uh, algorithm comes from al khwarizmi and of course this is a very interesting, again, genealogy for the mathematical term, but the idea is that so al khwarizmi it means that somebody coming from Khwarezm, and Khwarezm happens to be in the territory of Uzbekistan, and nobody cares that actually uh, al khwarizmi worked in Baghdad for most of his like, <laughs> career. And what happens is like there is kind of an interesting um, backward story about the history of mathematics and these kind of stories that I, also I can tell you if you are interested. <laughs> I've done this work in sort of in more detail. But so in the end, so what we have is an interesting uh, combination of things that computer scientists want to do, sort of the locals want to do, and the whole kind of enactment of uh, the, the, the history. Uh, at once of Uzbekistan, the construction of it, and the history of this new discipline. So like, right now we think it's Turing at that time, but like, of course it's al Khwarezmi who founded computer science. Right? And uh, one more time, we can go in more de 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 details about what was going on during this event, um, in particular discussion about the notion of algorithm itself. So for those of us who do not work in computer science, we tend to think that algorithm is a well-defined notion. It is not. Up to today, there are no mathematical definitions of algorithm, so there is a common sense understanding of it as some sort of recipe. Uh, but it's still debated, and uh, I just gave this talk in Paris to two people who do uh, mathematical logic, and they were really like fascinated by this story because it actually explains some of the debates that are ongoing today in the community, uh, and there is kind of a strong Russian school which has a, a different vision and mathematical logic about what algorithms do, and so on and so forth. So I'm going, not going into too many details regarding the conversations that happened there, but one probably interesting observation is to say uh, it's about interdisciplinarity, right, because what they tried to do at this event, they brought together people who do computer science and mathematics. Uh, and people who actually like, develop programs. Uh, and the conversations were apparently very lively, people remember it very well, but in terms of the scientific trace, like this conference is largely forgotten. And it's forgotten probably because also people kind of talked across each other, because among sort of the funny things I found about this conference, there was a very famous logician present there, a very old one, uh, Stephen Cleaney, and I was sort of looking into his historical work because he's done some, and he mentions one of the most prominent uh, uh, 
Austrian computer pioneers who was present there, but who has done an overview actually of Al Khwarizmi's work as a historian of Al Khwarizmi. Well, this was like somebody who worked for I, uh, for IBM for many years, right? So it's like he he totally kind of mismatched the identity of one of the participants of the conference. And this is kind of again one more time about how you make people talk and similarly they come together because we want to talk about algorithms. But what they get out of it is a kind of totally different story. And in a sense, this conference is largely forgotten, and I'm kind of among the rare, rare people who even kind of knows that this happens uh, at all. Um, so let's go back to actually what is going on there, and uh, among sort of the interesting statements that are uh, pronounced at this event is this discourse by Knuth when he actually talks about his vision of what the computer science is in social terms, and he talks about algorithmic thinking as something innate something natural that brings together like very much like in Yershov's discourse, right? So it's suddenly programming is something that is completely apolitical and you can share it and it was always there and now you just have these places which are called computer science departments when these people come together. So the conference itself also looks like this naturalized event. Of course it's normal but sort of across political boundaries we all come together and talk about the nature of algorithms together. But as is obvious from looking through the organization documents and from kind of a number of participants who wanted to come but didn't manage to make it across the boundaries, right? So there are a lot of kind of political questions. And I, again, so if you are interested more into this, this construction of sort of a, the, the political versus a political and its coexistence together, I can sort of walk you through about the tensions and in particular sort of the context of the period with the dissidents and the rise of the um, um, the movement for human rights in the Soviet Union and support um, uh, across. But what is really interesting here is, for, for me, for this particular paper, right, is this notion of algorithmic uh, uh, thinking as naturalized one. In a kind of the... the, the, the <laughs> I'm going to, to turn this notion on the hands up right now because the same person who is involved into the kind of organizing spaces for these discourses and participating in these discourses, Andrei Dershov, actually has also a very different usage for this term. And it's this usage is explicitly political and has an explicit articulation within the Soviet context. And here we are talking about the ideal that he promotes as for the profession but he would take this idea of universal programming literacy and bring it on to the tables of the Soviet government and into the classrooms in the Soviet Union of the 80s. Right? So we start in the 70s with an ideal and we will get into the world of politics and the world of education reform in the 80s with the very same notion of algorithmic thinking. This time, this notion of algorithmic thinking will become an educational goal uh, and this goal will be uh, articulated progressively, right? So we have this kind of articulation of an interest in universal computer literacy, and then we get into the real uh, experiences, and um, again, I do not have time to go into all the details. Uh, they exist all over the Soviet Union. I know particularly well the case of uh, Akadzim Garadok and uh, its summer schools for young programmers. They go in parallel with um, uh, Soviet-wide uh, initiatives uh, in newspapers, for instance, or like a lot of experiments are going on throughout the 70s, right? Again, it's interesting to think about Brezhnev period, about this, this period of experimentation. Um, but by the end of these experiments, we have a plan, right? And this idea that we can actually have a school informatics is formulated in 79, but by, in Russian. But by early 80s, we have Yershov already propagating these ideas again on the international scene. Right? He's using his authorities and international expert in computer science to articulate his vision for the reform of a society through computer education. And the society he thinks of is his own society. But in order to convince people at home, he's articulating his ideas abroad. Uh, in the, uh, by coincidence, it's in Lausanne, where I live now. Um, so he knows that he's going to speak to a large audience of non-specialists. And he actually, again, sort of something that I think we do not have 
we, we do not think enough in uh, the context of the Soviet um, history is about this conversation between uh, uh, like members of technical intelligence and creative intelligence. So he actually enlists the help of uh, one of the illustrators of Chimia uh, Zizny, I think, uh, Zlatkovsky, who produces a series of images illustrating main Gershov's points. And of course, so the title of his talk is uh, Programming the Second Literacy. And this is why we have this kind of flying book. This is the metaphor. But by the end of the talk, we actually learn that Yershov is not interested in metaphor. So I think metaphor is just a way to bring people in. So he has an agenda, right? Uh, and again, it's the same agenda everybody should program. But the question is why and how? And of course, we are talking about the automation systems and the, the microprocessors, right? You can see the hammer, which is the computer-like hammer. Uh, and there are kind of images are really interesting, but I particularly want to comment on two of them because they are in they're not only illustrating the shops ideas, but they're also somewhat subversive. So they kind of get to this uncomfortable point where your shop is all about how programming are actually natural again one more time because our algorithm our organism is stuffed with programs, right? But in the image of its kind of very positive description of Yershov turns into something much less uh, comfortable, right? With there is something violent about these kind of uh, strange things coming out of the body, right? That's one of them. And another one is uh, something like, you know, self-moderation that <laughs> Diana was talking about, right? So it's like he's all about, oh, all our daily life is actually like programs because we have a goal and then we go toward this uh, goal. So it's about the goal-oriented action. And then sort of uh, we have an illustration which is basically a self-censoring puppet, right? Which is much less comfortable with this kind of your show very positive uh, description of self-programming and what it means. But sort of the key, I think, the key uh, image, uh, no, well, well, I can talk a little bit more about sort of the particular philosophy of information that goes with sort of the computer and the book, um, but we can feel more interested in the ideas. But the, because of, of the time is going, right? So, no, no, but yeah. I just wanna, so where do these images appear? Uh, during his talk. During his, his talk. talk, yes. Okay. So he and shows so that he's, he's in Lausanne, he has to sh okay. show slides, right? And he wants to attract people, so he right. uh, okay. asks for illustrations. And I think sort of the, the probably what for me, what really helped me to understand what his message was about is this image of the programmer as a new man, right? So obviously uh, drawing on the much earlier iconography um, uh, of a new man from the um, uh, kind of uh, the, the much earlier, earlier history, right? And we have a kind of the, um, the description of this new man which comes with it. So it's a kind of man which is, who is resolute and prudent at the same time. And there are more of it in the text itself, which is, I found it pretty juicy because he also talks about kind of the bourgeois self and what's wrong with it. So it's like, it's too much abstract thinking, it's too much reading and not enough action. And so, but basically you can be the right citizen if you know how to program one more time, right? Because you not only think, but you also act accordingly. Um, so this text is, well, pretty well known and uh, translated in a number of languages and distributed pretty well and kind of relatively well cited, even if it's forgotten eventually, um, among the education, computer education specialists of the time. But where I want to go now is that this vision of programming literacy and algorithmic thinking, which comes with it, becomes actually part of the state policy in the sense that uh, one of the first things that Gorbachev does when he comes um, and he gets power, he signs um, a постановление правительства about the, uh, about the education reform. So September 85, the ninth graders all over the Soviet Union come into the class and they announced, oh, by the way, will, you will learn this new subject. Uh, and the subject is uh, Asmova Informatica Vyacheslitina Technica. So this is a controversial topic, and I'm aware of it, so the results of this reform. But sort of if we just do not talk yet about the results of the reform and what it means. So the, the process itself was, okay, so there's software to be written and uh, multiplicated and distributed textbooks. And the Yershov team was behind the, uh, uh, these textbooks and was again something unexpected, especially from the uh, perspective of the dominance of the English language in computer science and sort of computer-related conversation. Sometimes we associated sort of you know, the spread of English and spread of computerization more generally. So those 
uh, textbooks are translated in all national languages of the Soviet Union, right? Something so you can read, you can learn how to program in Uzbek or Estonian. And of course, there is a question of hardware there. And uh, this is again something very, very interesting question because we are very much thinking and very was very much criticized for like learning to swim without water, for not being able to actually provide each of the students with a computer of their own. And so there is a very interesting discussion about what we consider as the computer here because uh, I actually found a lot of evidence and I have a kind of a parallel project on uh, small computing devices which are the programmable calculators which were like, very, very important for realization of this project before the computer came into the classroom. But I guess I will wrap up there and uh, instead of sort of talking about the realization of reform, talk about the questions that this vision of the information society, not based on the access to the computer, but on the transformation of the subject, right, of the acquisition of the skills, what does it mean, right? And of course, for me, like as a historian, I'm actually thinking that we have a very different understanding of what do we talk about when we talk about the computer as a, a product of the Cold War. And about we are talking about really two visions of modernity, two visions of a digital modernity, right? And I think the uh, echoes from those visions are still with us, right? Because if we are not talking as historians, but we are talking as people, like as uh, citizens of this information society, we are all in, right? So, but who are the people who actually have control, right? Of this is with applications, right? So this kind of very kind of a set of questions that we all care about. What, what do we teach our children? Right? Uh, today is, I think, it's still with us, right? This idea of digital self and self-expression again, very, very important and prominent for all these texts and all these conversations. And again, we are talking about the politics of access and control. And I really think it's not an accident that Zlatkovsky was able to reuse, simply reuse one of his images to talk about the digital uh, divide. Those images are so bizarre, but it's... Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> oh, I, I, yeah, I think I'm done, right? Because uh, okay. I don't know how long I didn't... Uh, no, you have you have time, but it's yeah, okay. No, we, but can, we can save more time for questions, so Yeah, thank so you. it's okay. Oh, yeah. Good. <laughs> um, I think we all have... Questions, so maybe I'll start uh, <laughs> start with you because I have questions, but you know I speak too much anyway. So um, questions, thoughts, comments. I, I, I first have a, 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 I want to make sure I understand something correctly, mm -hmm. and then the verification question, mm -hmm. and then the real question. Mm -hmm. So um, the the slide with new new man. Mm -hmm. That language is coming from your main hero, right? Yoshov, or who's who, or not the language of the new new man, but the mm -hmm. quotation of the prudent and the resolute. Um, so the quotation comes from the talk of the, you know, and the text, the program of the second literacy, but it's my interpretation actually, so when I look at the image of the uh, pro pro resolute programmer, uh -huh. right, I made the connection with the iconography of the earlier period, yeah. so that's my connection. But I mean, the more obvious literary connection is the, the notion of the computer literacy itself, which of course sends us back to exactly the same period of the rise of this iconography of a new man and the questions of the computer, of, of the literacy campaigns after the revolution. And they, they actually replicate many forms as like, you know, the, the trains with, you know, with literacy propaganda you know, there. And then they kind of replicated it for trains with uh, computers and sort of to propagate a diffuse computer. Which is so it's like the, the parallels are much stronger, but I bring evidence for. But in the same time, it's always, so yeah, so it's, is it genealogy, right? Or is it more of a repl rep replica? I'm, I'm not sure myself. So, so, so this is my yeah. so who is the author of the quotation? So, Yershov. Yershov. Yeah. When was it written? Uh, 81. 81. And so, and do you see, I'm really interested in the links between the quotation and, uh, the, le and the idea that if we can uh, impute this to, uh, uh, say, Yershov, 
that he may be still interested in a very revolutionary project. That that we would agree with. That he's interested in a, in a, in a socialist revolutionary project of creating um, the new man. I think he believes that by learning to program, you can change. Yeah. So he is very much into like, uh, yes, yes, yeah. and. And do they, do, do, do any of these computer scientists use it? This is, this is just a sort of plain question, this basic question. Do any of them use the language of knowledge uh, no, they don't. No, they don't. But the description of this man is so close to yeah. yes, to, to the language. Uh, but right, so this is where it is tricky because like the quote I didn't give from the seventy-two talk, but I really like very much, which is really like structurally reads like this description of a you know Kamsamolka, Krasavica, ah, you know in the. It's personal, it's not the Krasavica, but this again, right, in itself, like in popular culture, it's a reference to the official discourse. And if you look into the description of the, like, the Kamsamol, uh, what the Kamsamol should look like, so I actually saw, like, the, from the newspapers of the period, of course, this, the, the rhetorical structure is exactly the same. And so what Yershov does, he kind of strings these qualities which look come some more like qualities and the rhetorical structure of a kind of uh, this uh, ideological language into his 72 talk to the Americans. But the things he plugs in are actually like, you know, different qualities, right? Coming from the American cultural references, like Edisonian inventiveness, all right? And so, like, for, for me, Edisonian it's, inventiveness? so programmer should have an Edisonian inventiveness and the, the, uh, I have a different talk, but you know, so just want to, to shrink it a little bit. Um, um, so, it, it, yes, so I mean, this is kind of an interesting point, right? For, for me, like when I read your Chuck, right? On one hand, I can recognize a number of things in my story, but other things just simply do not fit in, right? Just to, and for me, sort of this kind of, the, kind of very creative usage of the language, which we would think it should be like the new spec or super speak and it should be all frozen and people just, you know, play with it. No, it could be used like for the purposes which are still pretty revolutionary. And this is for me, it's like I do not have a good historiographical explanation in the description of the late Soviet period to accommodate such projects today. Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of, yeah. It, but you had more? You had like a. No, no, I was thinking it, it made it sound like it was a small part, but I guess I had a couple of things. No, that, that was it. Okay, you got it. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Uh, did you take into account uh, the material limitations to these uh, ideas of uh, new man? I mean, mm -hmm. that uh, if you want to implement the uh, informatics in school, mm -hmm. you have to. Mm -hmm. oh, precisely, that was the yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. uh, we, mm -hmm. if we If we see the history, we know that uh, for quite a long time uh, computers was quite expensive and uh, was used mm -hmm. uh, collectively in mm -hmm. some central mm -hmm. collective, collective, collective uh, for very few years. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, it was absolutely not enough to. Uh, implement these ideas mm -hmm. that by using computers mm -hmm. change the thinking, uh, the way of thinking mm -hmm. of uh, mass of people because you simply don't uh, have I, 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 I get your question, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. did you notice any influence of these ideas mm -hmm. to the decisions of how many computers mm -hmm. should be produced? Mm -hmm. I mean that if this idea is influential enough, mm -hmm. the result should be that we should... Uh, I, I have answers, yes. Uh, very good, very good. Yeah, okay. yeah. I, I can talk you through this. Uh, yeah. mm. So, I do not have like an absolute mastery of numbers, so this is not what I have, but I can explain you the patterns. And the patterns are very, very curious and, again, recognizably Soviet. It's precisely like the Ben's uh, story of like unrestrained competition. So, we all kind of... It's like what we all kind of know, even if nobody has written about it, right? Is that the management of the production of computing was actually under several ministries. So by the time when the government says, okay, we will uh, supply something on the order of one million computers to schools, there is an enormous fight between the ministers for who is going to get the order. 
And uh, the echoes of this fight is just simply fascinating. For instance, I'm working with one very curious kind of um, uh, movie, which was kind of a publicity for the program. And I'm not going to show it now because it's like, it, you know, it, it's, it's interesting to talk about it on its own, right? And one of this, the moments that we have actually children working on the computer, and then you have a zoom on the screen. And on the screen we have points, bullet points. And in these bullet points, it explains why a particular model of a computer produced by that ministry of electronics or whatever it is, is bad. And it's bad because of this and because of, like, for medical reasons and the bad in terms of uh, its failures and it's bad in terms of... So it's a, it's a very interesting sort of insertion of an anti-product, <laughs> basically, campaign <laughs> in the state-produced uh, uh, publicity movie for the, uh, for, for the literacy campaign of your show itself. So this is kind of... So there are some traces, if, uh, uh, so there are some people who've been part of this system themselves and who has described some of this, what they call a jungle, of the computer systems created for the reform and some of the kind of interesting developments with the reform itself is also that they actually bought a number of uh, personal computers but not the personal computers of the IBM series but the kind of the dead branch that nobody remembers now uh, which was produced in Japan, Yamaha, mm -hmm. which were extremely popular and very influential in the Soviet kind of microcomputer culture of the 80s. That's kind of one direction. If we do talk about microcomputing, it's again very interesting to compare what happened in the West where also an explosion, the jungle. So there's kind of a parallel two parallel jungle stories here. But, so this is where I really want to bring this conversation. It's not about the computer. And it's not about the computer on two levels. And this is kind of this conceptual shift is really, really important. Because on one hand, for Yershov, and it's very explicit in sort of in his conceptualization of the problem, the way he fights for it. So what matters is really this transformation of the mind, right? It's the plan, why do you sit with the computer? So it's like there's a great letter that he writes to one of the children, school children who write back to him and he's like writing them back saying it's like, even if you sit in front of the machine, right, without a plan, without a program, it will stay this impenetrable piece of metal, a box, right? And what he thinks with computer in itself is secondary. He wants them to have computer. He's not against it, right? He wants them to have it, but he thinks that he can make his reform even while the computer is still only about to arrive. Right, that's kind of one thing, and then if you look into the, how the textbooks themselves are constructed, about the didactical tools that they used, so it's, it's really like there is a deep thinking and experimentation behind, so they're very, very much aware of this problem, right, they have sort of ways to replace the computer so that we can, me and Diana can enact, so I'll write a program, show enact the computer, and this is how I learn that I should not be making certain types of mistakes when I'm coding, right, so it's like the, the presence of the computer itself is not essential and in a sense that like, it's very much uh, popular today where there are sort of computerless programming classes, it, it's sort of a Raspberry Pi project, so this kind of ideas about the presence of the machine, what the machine really does, the interface and so on, it's very very actual in the today's debate on computational thinking and what sort of the presence of the machine, so it's, it, it's there. Um, and in this sense, right, it's ironic that this uh, kind of material problem that the Soviets had in the 80s now looks like a great conceptual, you know, prescient uh, way of educating uh, children, right? That's one way. And the, the last way I want to sort of mention, so they had kind of solutions, right, to the fact that they cannot supply everybody with a machine, right? And the solution was, again, shared, right, with computer centers and sort of children moving toward the computers, toward the schools that actually had computers. And of course, in terms of the price, so the calculators cost around 60 rubles, right? So the calculator was something that actually was produced in masses, right? Not for the purposes of computer education, but for engineers who were, again, also mass-produced by the Soviet education systems. And so uh, the idea was that you would replace the logarithmic uh, linea, the, the rule uh, with um, with these uh, programmable calculators, and they're like, literally mass produced by millions of units, and the price was affordable. Yeah, so there was like a mass computer society, but it just different, looking different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you don't need a computer to have a computer society, or that kind of a computer, yeah. you're saying. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. but, yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, 
last night and I was on my way to the train station and I met a foreigner who was not able to find the metro because no one's around him speak English. Mm -hmm. And then he asked me why, whether that, that anyone in Russia speak English mm -hmm. and they replied that uh, literally everyone must uh, learn English in school, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but uh, we, all, we, all, we all know the result. Uh, so my question is if if I am just an ordinary serving people mm -hmm. and I don't see a computer, mm -hmm. uh, computer. okay, mm -hmm. let's talk not about late 80s, mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about early, early 70s. Mm -hmm. I don't see any computers around me mm -hmm. because uh, I don't have a computer, my father doesn't have a computer, mm -hmm. uh, the whole organization where my father works also doesn't, doesn't have a computer. Mm -hmm. and whether some, somebody tells me that uh, you, have an, you have an opportunity to learn a computer mm -hmm. and uh, you have an opportunity to transform your way of thinking, mm -hmm. why should I do this? What's, uh, uh, how they try mm -hmm. to make uh, ordinary people feel interested in it? Mm -hmm. Because if we, if we don't uh, have an, an opportunity to apply our knowledge, uh, our knowledge is useless and we forget it. So, what's the purpose? Uh, I mean, uh, from the usual point of view, it's more or less clear. He has an idea that this will transform the way people think. But uh, what's the uh, what's the goal of ordinary people to adopt this idea? Why why they should learn computer science and transform their way of thinking if they don't see computers surround them? Mm -hmm. I think sort of um, my reaction is going to be I'm going to trick you, right? And I'm going to trick you in a historian's way. So chronology does matter enormously in this story because this conversation, right? This is why so he talks about it as an ideal in 72 and he has a political goal by 79. What happens in between is of course the shrinking is microelectronics. Right, so this kind of like the so this is kind of again so something like the conversation I can have with Diana, right? So we know Michael Mahoney's work very well. So it's like in computer history, so it's the problem of periodization, right? And one of it is that for a long time in computer history, when people talked about computers, they were talking the change from one generation to another, right? If you still talk to like engineers who spend their life doing computer, that's the way they conceptualize historical change. For them, it's from one generation of computers to another, and computer progressively gets smaller. When historians decided that they want sort of their history, which includes this kind of ordinary people, right, in this process of computerization that you're talking about, which is still ongoing, right? Uh, they're like, this kind of sh uh, way to divide periods from one generation of machines getting smaller and smaller doesn't work for us. We want social processes. We want to account for different generations of humans from different communities, and we should work with things like software, we should work look into things like like the standardization quantification that is that pre exist in these communities to see how they're going to computerize their knowledge. Right? And uh, in a way what I see in my story is that you need both of those. Right? What you need this understanding of different communities, right? Because it's not ordinary person, right? This person has an identity. And it depends on what kind of professional personal identity he has. If he happens to be a mathematician or a teacher or an engineer or like a farmer, right? We can talk about different computerization processes. Right? And so what I am arguing is kind of that we to understand to have a full vision of computing history during the Cold War, we need both technological history where we account for transformation of technology when computer actually becomes affordable with microelectronics. And this is why Yershov gets into the education because he knows that soon he would be able to supply the children with computers. Right, so this is kind of where, but, but, but the bigger question is that we need to account for the transformation of technology itself and for the social processes that really look at the encounter between the two. I just want to ask, yeah. and don't forget that this time, I mean, the 70s and mm. 80s, is the boom of uh, uh, science fiction prose mm. and uh, journals and magazines and popular mechanics, let's mm. say, and probably 
So actually, so in Strugatsky, Понедельник начинается в субботу, the main protagonist, Alexander Privalov, is a programmer, right? And uh, he, when he encounters uh, Roman, uh, whatever, <laughs> or, or, or <laughs> so the conversation they have is like, we really need a programmer. And it's like, what kind of programmer? It's like, I can call a couple of friends. And they're like, wow, we need a programmer which like, <laughs> doesn't ask for like, yeah, a good programmer, which doesn't ask for a salary and, and works all the time. And he's like, do you want an angel? And they're like, no, 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 just an ordinary one will do. So it's like people are aware of it, right? So, but uh, yeah, the ordinary is kind of an interesting kind of part of your question. You wanted something like, else yeah. to add, yeah. 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 So I would like to continue your previous question on the collective individual mm -hmm. experience mm -hmm. of the computer. Uh, do you think that uh, with a computer, like, the state or some authorities wanted um, to, and with, with this new man mm -hmm. idea, uh, whether or not uh, the state wanted to create individual user, or it still tended to to keep this collective mm -hmm. way of doing something. So I think your question is not obvious because it's like we don't say who the state is, right? Yes, so I think in, in the, the discourse that you so in, in the speech of so Yeshuv himself is also part of the state, and this is yeah. why he wants to transform the society by going through this kind of uh, uh, the, the state way, and it's kind of also fascinating the way he uses patronage networks actually to get to Gorbachev. But that's a different. Uh, but that's not what you're asking for. If we think about the official discourses, I mean, the one way to to look for it is about the kind of a professionalization, mm -hmm. right? It's like, you don't have a specialty, right, for, for, for programmers, and progressively it emerges, right, so it gets a number, it gets a uh, cathedra in universities where you start training those people, right, and you require them to acquire a number of skills, and this is how sort of it gets through the society, through probably the, the training system and kind of the attribution of uh, professional and the, the specialties to, to those uh, to people who actually know how to do something with computers. That's probably one way to answer it. But the, in the collective in this part is corporate, in the corporate, not in the source of the corporation, but in the source of the corporate body of professionals. And Yashov is very much involved into trying to bring these people together. Right? So the first conference for the, progr for the Soviet programmers is in Kiev for good reasons that Ben knows what about, but the second one is in Novosibirsk and Yashov runs it. Right? And he brings together something like over 1,000 programmers in Soviet Union in 71. So we have a body of people who do this work uh, professionally and they kind of have a certain identity to them. Um, so that would be probably the way to see how the kind of the collective individual comes to it, because sort of Yashov talks about the individual qualities that programmer has to have, but the idea is that all of these people who belong to the profession kind of have these qualities, rather right, than society recognizes them. Uh, I'm not sure that what I'm talking about is like the top level, how the state imagines the, um, this new expertise. Um, so they are kind of more interested in the, in the technical way because the systems cannot function without these people mm -hmm. in an interesting way. So they talk about automation, but in order to, it's like the irony of Mary Hicks actually talks a lot about in her work on operators, right? You think that you're creating these automatic systems, but actually what you, in parallel with creating these automatic systems, you create new kinds of people who make this system work. So this is where I see one of those and the other way sort of what I see on the level of the state discourse is that like they're worried, and they're worried about money, as always, mm -hmm. and the way they're worried about money, so they actually, they think that computers are going to optimize things, and they invest in the computers, and people from the gospel and that Alexei knows more about, sort of, uh, have computers, and then they start monitoring what these computers really do, and it happens so that these computers actually duplicate labor, right, so people still keep their accounting departments, and they just give certain type of work to the computer, and they keep of on doing parallel work in two systems, right? And the government becomes aware of it because they, they do do some monitoring and they say, this is wrong, this is wrong, we should be doing something about it, but let's, let's change. But what is interesting in this story, that it's not so much a 
particular, peculiarly Russian story in this sense. So probably the scale of the problem is greater, but the problem itself is very much familiar to what happens in Great Britain, for instance, or what happens in many kind of American corporations, when there is even though on a public level, it is about the same time in the 70s, probably 60s, people would probably know better about that. But there is this backlash at some point, it's like, so everybody promotes computers as this kind of uh, efficiency devices. Mm -hmm. um, Karina Schlombs would know more about that too, uh, on the kind of American and the Western European side. But in reality, right, so this kind of process of change and introducing sort of the match between whatever work you want the computer to do and what the way you used to do it is actually extremely labor intensive. And this is what explains the success of IBM 360. Because what they say, so once you make this change, you don't need to do any more changes because whenever you want to upgrade your computer, it's still going to be software compatible. And this is what everybody wants because they just want the thing to run and not to do anything else. Mm -hmm. So that is basically a sort of uh, the, the link into kind of understanding this kind of very, again, controversial story about what happens in the Soviet Union and the Soviet uh, industry and why they went for the uh, IBM 360 copies. Yes. Um, so, thank you. I have, uh, I'm, I'm trying to formulate kind of a, a somewhat nebulous um, intuition, so bear with me for a minute. But, um, only one? Well, there are many <laughs> nebulous intuitions, you know me. Um, but, um, there's a certain sense I get of, of a kind of a, the mystification of mm -hmm. the programmer in order to make mm -hmm. the programmer an everyman, mm -hmm. right? Which is kind of an interesting and not necessarily an intuitive turn. Because mm -hmm. if you think today, when we talk about computer literacy, mm -hmm. for the most part, you're not going to have campaigns to learn how to program. Mm -hmm. Raspberry Pi is an exception in this mm -hmm. case. There's a turn back toward mm -hmm. that kind of movement to say, to demystify, to open up what mm -hmm. programming is and say, it's not so complicated. It's actually pretty straightforward. It's not like rocket and science. And girls can like, do it. Girls can do it. Like your grandma can do it. Everyone can do it, right? And mm. because I think the trend has gone the other way, which is com to completely mystify the process of programming, mm. relegate it to the level of like intense expertise of a particular mm. set of people, mm -hmm. right? Um, computer scientists, and and no. and otherwise. Well, not okay, we'll see. <laughs> but but um, <laughs> but then um, you know, in terms mm. of so so the device itself has become extremely popular. Mm. And everybody in this room knows how to use. Mm -hmm. some prepackaged form of it and yet yeah. like I would guess most yeah. people mm -hmm. in this room do not know how to program mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right what you're actually suggesting in your story is the opposite story mm -hmm. you don't need the device mm -hmm. <laughs> the device might be like irrelevant to well, what you it actually will change do. it will different it will one change, will appear you will have other things but what you yeah. need yeah. to know how to do is to program mm -hmm. right and I'm interested in kind of when this historical rift happened and how it happened because the you know some rec some features of the story are recognizable mm -hmm. But I think what's really not recognizable is like the move to say, you know, the programmer is the everyman. Because I think in, in, in our society today, it's like it's turned to be very much kind of the opposite, right? The programmer needs to be like specially trained mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and everybody else can learn how to use this and use the Microsoft Word and mm -hmm. use all this kind of prepackaged mm -hmm. stuff. And I'm wondering if like the layer of software mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, is missing, right? Because in your story, there is this kind of vision of a one-to-one -one relationship between mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the person sits down mm -hmm. and does code, right? Mm -hmm. um, and does something, something mm -hmm. related to mm -hmm. algorithms, and, and mm -hmm. there it is, right? Um, and in our case, there's like always the layer of the interface. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the interface does not need you to go beyond, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So uh, my question, I guess, has to do with that layer of the interface, and if it's the interface mm -hmm. that actually reshapes mm -hmm. um, our, you know, our relationship to programming. Mm -hmm. um, right. Yeah, I love it. So, to give, so you have a different subparts to your question, right? To the current discussions, so we can't have this conversation too, but sort of to go to the kind of the core of it about the, uh, this, the, the program itself. So, what Yershov's dream was, and not only Yershov's, it's like many people's dream was McCarthy, like one of his main American interlocutors, who is the, or was one of the founders of the so called artificial intelligence, is that you would be able to talk to computer. 
-hmm. right? You would be able to program it in uh, uh, language, like the human language, right? So mo most of those people in the from 50s on, they work, they invent new programming languages. Right? And this is kind of, we talk about the Babylon of programming languages, right? But mm -hmm. at least during a certain time, so it's, it's an interesting, it's a story of, like, the, the way I know it's just a story of Algo, right? This um, international project of creating a universal computer language, right? And the idea is that you need to make computers. So, so at some point, like, whenever they make one computer, when they made the second one, right? And the second one was somewhat different from the first one, we realized that they had to reprogram it, right? And I said, oh, what about if we could have the same program running here and there, right? It was a like, very pragmatic, very important question, like for the military backup, for instance, right? So it's like everybody cared about that. But at the point that you, want to have same program running on the two computers, so you need people to talk to themselves. And this is what was Algol was about, right? Sort of creating like this free level of one hand, sort of the level of, a, so, or, of a language which can run like here and there, right, on two machines. The, the interaction between the machine and the, uh, the human, so the human doesn't need to learn the machine code, but sort of use the concepts which are much closer to mathematical problems, problems that he wants to conceptualize into the program, right? But also how do humans who have these mathematical problems talk to each other, mm -hmm. right? The notation, algo notation, actually, this is the sort of, it was a failure, commercial failure, but it was a success in, the, in the terms of the adoption of its notational practices, for instance, mm -hmm. right? And this is what, fortunately, at least there are some people who work on algo, and this is kind of one of the arguments that's been out there for in, the, in recent literature. So this is kind of one example, and so this is kind of one of the answers to sort of this question of how that this kind of non-intuitive imagination comes together, because the projection of the that we had at this time is not that having that packages mm -hmm. that create this illusion, right? But really being able to talk to the machine in the language which is very close to your language. And it, what is kind of fascinating is this persistence of this vision throughout time. Because it is like you, you would read the talks that uh, McCarthy would give at one of the first um, artificial intelligence kind of gatherings in England. Mm -hmm. in, uh, you would probably know it. Is the it 50. No, it's it's right after that. There is another one in England. You should look at it. Yeah, uh, so okay, so so okay. Uh, mm, uh, okay. gives a talk, and what he describes is like so close to what Google does for us now, but technically very different because what McCarthy thinks is that he'll be asking the computer and the computer will be kind of understanding his program and giving him the road to the airport. Well, now Google is doing the matching, right? So the technology is different, but the social kind of demand of what computers are supposed to be doing for you has been imagined, you know, back, back there. Um, and so I think this is where sort of this non-intuitive part comes to it, that this layer of communication would be different. And what is kind of interesting from the kind of linguistic perspective there is that up to the 80s, Yershov is actually part of this initiative of a kind of computerized Russian fund uh, initiative that we are trying to computerize all of Russian, right? Which is a, a language, yes. So that, 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 that eventually, right, he's not abandoning this idea that you can talk to computer in Russian. And the crazy part, uh, which is like very controversial within the, uh, among the kind of the school children who had to program using the software that Yershov and his team wrote, was actually the usage of Russian. Because Yershov wrote his uh, educational software in Russian. Because, again, it comes from this algo tradition that you have the, uh, um, Kind of the shared script, but then you can make a translation in any like national language. Uh, but the children who already had access to computers, they would already have some uh, notions of programming in basic, which is English, and they would say, "Screw this kind of uh, like Russian <laughs> with its str strange software given by the state. We want the basic, right?" And there is kind of a huge controversy about what basic, why basic is bad for kind of developing thinking habits and good thinking habits in programming, which was kind of really a huge debate like, you know, from 60s and 70s on. Uh, so, yeah, but it's again, so it's interesting sort of on the, um, so uh, your question is kind of a Stacy question, but my, my kind of, my, my answer to you is much more transnational in the sense that for me, this right. conversation becomes a conversation about transnational flows and about communication mechanisms, right? When the language itself, like in Michael's book, right, about the uh, mm -hmm. uh, scientific languages is really an important 
instrument, vehicle, and medium of uh, sort of of making social collectives. So this is yeah. 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 So I, I, can I just do like a tiny follow up <laughs> and then because I, I can't shut up, and, and, uh, but I really want to. Yeah, I want to no, hear no, no, so. But, no, but, but here's the thing. Like, okay, so I just I just remember this very clearly because uh, this is going to be slightly autobiographical. But uh, I remember very well when my mother, who used to be employed by the Baku State Oil Field, what have you, as a programmer, uh, decided to leave that and become a teacher. Yeah, for this kind of yeah, for this kind of thing. Uh, and she got a job at one of the top, like the main prestigious high school in Baku, at the time where they got computers. Like, this is the only school that had computers. And they had Yamaha computers, right? And this was a classroom. Uh, they had like three doors with locks on it. They, it was like a cage to enter, right? Um, and she had the key and only one other person in the school had the key and it was just, you know, huge yeah. responsibility. Um, and she would enter this classroom um, and then they had a safe and in the safe was kept a mouse. Uh -huh. Because the mouse was like somehow this yeah. unique and highly reified object. But what happened, if you watch um, the way that the interaction, the teaching happened, the students had monitors, mm -hmm. right? The teacher had a computer. Yeah. So there was one computer and a bunch of monitors, monitors. Yeah. Yeah. right? So the teacher could like show them how to do something, mm -hmm. and then they would kind of enter their queries, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's like if we're thinking about network organization yeah. and the yeah. interfaces, mm -hmm. right? So like they would enter their queries and the teacher mm -hmm. would respond and say something, but um, uh, but I, can, I think like here, like I understand your argument about like the, the trying to craft a big uh, meta, um, the, the global interactions, but then I think the actual physical interactions with the object become super important and interesting in the way they structure even mm -hmm. like the possibility of access to that kind of knowledge because mm -hmm. here they are, you know, organized in a particular kind of way mm -hmm. uh, through a particular hierarchy, through particular commands and I just remember actually encountering this for the first time and seeing all these kind of strange green letters mm -hmm. appearing on the screen and, you know, I thought this was cool, you could draw pictures with it, right? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> because basically that was the only thing I could imagine to do with these, you know, dashes and O's. Um, but, uh, like, I don't know, okay, maybe I'm just uh, getting a little too abundant with, uh, with detail here, but I think, like, it's, it's interesting that there is, like, this tension between the Russian and English, and not just in a linguistic sense, but, like, the strangeness and the weirdness you encounter as you sit down and you see all these zeros and dashes, and then you see them in English, and then you need to enter some commands, and that's not actually intuitive connected to programming as a concept. That's like weird things that you have to do, which is not unlike what we have to do when we now teach people to open Microsoft Word, right? So I guess I'm trying to like still make that rift a little bit between programming as like a conceptual thing and still the strangeness, though not as abundant as we have it today with uh, layers of interfaces and programs, um, et cetera, et cetera. But like, I guess I still think that this could be weird enough, but okay, we'll, we can talk about this later because I really want to see what... Yeah, um, but what I like in your story is like this geographical uh, variation, right? Mm -hmm. That you introduced sort of the particularity of region and how different it's kind of from Moscow. This is probably the state where kind of interesting that this state question is coming in as well, because like the cases that I saw sort of while working from Dukens, it was not the Baku case, but it's like unexpectedly sort of the, the same rhetoric show kind of rise back to this school girl from Khabarovsk, that there are classes up there north, you know, and the teachers and students like produce a great job. He's just making it up. Like couldn't be, right? It's like somewhere in this kind of random village. Why I understand in Moscow in like elite schools they would have this mm -hmm computers, right? Maybe one school in Baku, right? Village somewhere. Turns out, yes, they got a, one of the one of the mm -hmm. best classes of Agat computers early on in the small village. I forgot its name. It's uh, Hantemansisk Okrok, right? Mm -hmm. And then I started looking and then and said, turns out that there was a school, right? And there was like an enthusiast, a mathematical teacher who was like crazy enough to walk on all the doors of the officials and got the year of support and so this is how he got the class. But also he got the money because it turns out that there was again oil industry, right? And mm -hmm. just before we had the real class, they already had the old calculators which could be programmed in basic and this class, this is already, there was a community of children who right. already knew how to program when they got these Agat computers which are clones of the Apple computers and again mm -hmm. a very different interface and blah 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 and we can sort of, you know, right. to make this story 
story and us, but it's right. like about between your, so there is a real link between your industrial complexes, know, right, and regions. What I'm saying and is then, that maybe we still should not think that just because you know how to use a calculator, you're going to intuitively understand how to use a computer, right? So even though there's continuity, there could be rubber. But you can really, make okay, the so difference like between we, the calculator and the computer. We'll say this outside. Right? Uh, Liana. Это интересный вопрос, потому что как бы я, насколько я понимаю сама, то есть как бы эволюцию идей Ершова, потому что его идеи нестабильны, да, они как бы, они изменяются в зависимости от, как бы, как я уже говорила, да, от технологических изменений, но тоже от как бы тех проблем, с которыми он сталкивается. И мое впечатление, что вот эти вот его интерес, потому что к, в, в, а, потому что дети программировали, был довольно-таки опять-таки практически и связан с тем, что... Он видел будущее компьютеризации, да? он думает, что будет все больше компьютеров, что они будут все более важны для экономики. Он, он видит, что нужны будут программисты. Программистов было очень трудно выпускать. И даже когда их выпускали, это не значит, что они были хорошие. И эта ситуация, на самом деле, очень хорошо описана для американского варианта Ансмингер, uh, да, где он как раз и говорит о том, что даже если вы создали эти департаменты компьютеризации, не значит, что, что, то, что люди там выпускаются, что они могут практически делать как бы хорошие программы, да, и что, в общем-то, грубо говоря, они говорят о том, что то есть в 70-х, то есть они специалисты вот так собираются за кругом сон, говорят, ну вот чтобы были хорошие программисты, это занимает примерно 10 лет, да, чтобы он научился. Откуда эти 10 лет <laughs> взяться, да, и особенно если их мало. Вот. И как бы эта, программа, эта проблема постоянная, постоянная, она до сих пор как бы с нами, да, то есть как бы в новой форме, но то есть для него как бы вариант решения этой проблемы как раз, то есть у него есть, уже он артикулировал этот идеал, в том, что вот хорошо бы, чтобы, наша, чтобы мы не были элитой, это как раз его идеал, да, то есть как бы мы идем в то, что идеал у него есть. И он очень довольно-таки такой социалистический идеал, да, о том, что вот все должны как раз, все научились читать, все должны научиться программироваться. И он просто так как бы это кидает в воздух. А потом, как бы параллельно, да, он сталкивается с той проблемой, что очень трудно формировать этих профессионалов. Да? И он говорит о том, что хорошо, мы не можем их формировать на уровне университета, потому что это не всегда полезно, не всегда удачно. А что если, и вот здесь как раз он очень близок к кнуту, да, что если как бы каждый немножко может, мы всех немножко научим, а потом из тех, как бы, из тех кто будут иметь как бы базовые представления о программировании, да, вырастут специалисты и станут элитами, потому что на самом деле как бы вот одна из критик его э, реформы, его видения реформы образования была в том, что ну, зачем всем быть программистами профессиональными. Он говорит, нет, вам не надо, не будьте. Но мы всех научим немножко, и из этих тех, у кого будет хорошо получаться, они пойдут в профессиональное программирование. Потому что это был дебат, на самом деле, не, то, что, не только на уровне как бы, международного сообщества, то есть политических реакций на саму его идею образовательной реформы, но и внутри самого сообщества. Например, у меня есть письма, когда он обменивается с письмами с другими своими как бы, товарищами программистами ну, там, с, с Петербурга и с Москвы, с важными как бы, лицами, и они как бы, ему напрямую говорят, За, зачем ты это делаешь? Да? И он как бы, вот, у него есть вот эти как бы, свои идеи, почему и как. И, то есть, и оно интересно такое получается пересечение того, что 
есть идеалы и есть как бы, практические вопросы, которые он в силу обстоятельств своей карьеры должен решать, и они как бы ведут его к новым идеям, которые у него оказывается возможность и желание пробивать на более высоком уровне. Ну, потому что там уже как бы дальше есть ну, как бы сложный момент того, как он это пробивает на уровне полит политической. То есть я это немножко меньше смотрела, но у меня есть представление о том, как это случилось, потому что есть тоже как бы интересные заметки. Обед с великовым в такой должен. То есть а больше ничего нет, но понятно, что потом кто-то ему пишет опять-таки, а, а, а нельзя ли квартиру получить? Он спрошу у великого. Ну, то есть как бы такие моменты, которые позволяют проследить немножко о том, как то есть, реализация видения могла произойти на, через структуры государственные. А, так что, то есть, как бы, да, то есть, вот этот, то есть он, у него есть идеалы, но у него есть также как бы, понимание, как это функционирует, и то есть, как бы, он умеет навигировать эту систему. Спасибо.